just a few days ago, I was in a rather contemplative mood. It went something like this. Wait a second. Where is my wallet? Ah, there it is. I wonder, what is the volume of a dollar bill? How many pennies would it take to line up the Empire State Building? Hmm. How many atoms are there in this glass of water, I wonder? These might seem like random questions, but the art of solving them carries wondrous insights about creativity, logical reasoning, and the ability to take a little risk. Stay tuned to find out how such questions connect the Trinity nuclear tests with the number of piano tuners in New York City. Welcome to The Scribbled Equation. I am Dr. Ashmeet Singh. I'm a physics professor with a PhD in theoretical physics, and I'm here to show you how physics and math are lurking in every corner of our lives. How wondrous and intriguing are universes. All this by just scribbling a few equations. If you're new here, I hope you will consider subscribing to my channel by clicking on the bell icon below. If you're back again for more, thank you for being here. It's great to see you again. All right, back to the scribbling. All those questions I asked before, they all share certain very interesting features. For one, they all sound absurd. With answers, we have no conceivable way of knowing immediately or having any intuition for. There is a stratified complexity to the problem. Many different, seemingly unrelated components will work together to get to the answer. For example, both the mass of a single water molecule and the total mass of water in this glass will be relevant in estimating the number of water molecules there are. We are only interested in quick order of magnitude estimates, not precise answers. The goal is to approximate to the nearest power of 10. Differentiating between 100 or 100,000 is far more useful than pinpointing the answer down to either 103 or 123. Finding the precise answer is often very tedious or resource intensive, be it in terms of time or the equipment needed. And finally, they provide crucial insights into how different scales connect within the problem. What we just encountered are examples of Fermi problems, where the goal is to estimate the order of magnitude of the solution using nothing but back-of-the-envelope methods. They are named after Enrico Fermi, the 1938 physics Nobel laureate who won the prize for his discoveries related to neutron-induced nuclear reactions. While Fermi did pioneering work in statistical physics and quantum theory, he is most renowned for his work in nuclear physics. He is credited as the creator of the world's first nuclear reactor, the Chicago Pile 1. And if this wasn't enough, he was exceptionally good at making guesstimates of extreme sounding problems using very limited information. So much so that these problems are now named after him. Fermi was part of the Manhattan Project during World War II which developed the world's first atomic weapons. Legend has it that during Trinity, the first nuclear test held on July the 16th, 1945, Fermi estimated the strength of the atomic bomb based on the distance pieces of paper he dropped from his hand traveled during the blast. Hear it in his own words from this declassified memo from the Los Alamos National Lab. About 40 seconds after the explosion, the air blast reached me. I tried to estimate its strength by dropping from about 6 feet small pieces of paper before, during and after the passage of the blast wave. Since at the time there was no wind, I could observe very distinctly and actually measure the displacement of the pieces of paper that were in the process of falling while the blast was passing. The shift was about two and a half meters, which at the time I estimated to correspond to the blast that would be produced by 10,000 tons 
of TNT. His estimate of 10 kilotons of TNT equivalent is about half the actual yield of 21 kilotons that was released and made public much, much later. It's remarkable how Fermi could get within a factor of two of the actual yield based on such a rudimentary measurement. The actual method he used to get his estimate is still not known, though there have been recent attempts to reconstruct his line of reasoning. Fermi problems are not just for science. They are powerful tools that cultivate critical thinking and problem-solving prowess, spanning fields as diverse as economics, engineering, and even our everyday decisions. They help elevate our ability to tackle complex challenges using creativity and confidence. For example, it is important for a hot dog manufacturing conglomerate to know whether they should produce a million or a billion hot dogs for the 4th of July. To quote Lawrence Weinstein from his wonderful book, Guestimation 2.0, the ability to guesstimate on your feet is an essential skill to have in today's world. Whether you're trying to distinguish between a billion dollar subsidy and a trillion dollar stimulus, or between a megawatt wind turbine or a gigawatt nuclear power plant. Let's try our hand on a classic problem. Enrico Fermi was famous for asking this question to students in their PhD oral examinations, and it has become iconic since. How many piano tuners are there in New York City? Now at first, this seems impossible, but let's try and break it down into smaller, tangible, and more estimatable quantities. What's the population of New York City? Well, it's probably more than 5 million, but less than 10 million. So let's assume it to be around 8 million or so. So we have about 8 million people in New York City. On average, an household has about 2 people, giving us about 4 million households altogether. Of these households, I would probably estimate that about one in every 20 households probably owns a piano, giving us an estimate of about 200,000 pianos altogether in New York City. Let's tune this literally and figuratively. Say a piano is tuned about once every year or so. So we have about 200,000 tunings in one year. What about your average piano tuner? I would probably estimate that the average piano tuner does about three tunings per day and taking about 250 working days in a year, 250 days working in a year, we get about 750 tunings per tuner per year. Putting it all together, so we need about 200,000 tunings per year and the average tuner is able to do 750 tunings in a given year and therefore we need about 200,000 divided by 750, which is approximately 250 piano tuners altogether in New York City. Let's verify it. Let's go over to the Wolfram Alpha knowledge engine and ask it for the number of piano tuners in New York City. It gets us about 240 people as of 2022 and the source of this data is the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Pretty reliable, I would say. We got an estimate of 250 piano tuners in New York City using a simple approach to the Fermi problem. Fun, isn't it? The strategy we used is called divide and conquer as suggested by Sanjay Mahajan in his book, The Art of Insight, 
in science and engineering. We break the problem into a tree diagram where every branch in a layer multiplies together to give an estimate for the parent node and the process repeats until we get what we are looking for. Notice if you see a minus 1 on a branch, you have to multiply that term by its inverse. This technique is very powerful in breaking down complex multi-scale problems into smaller, more manageable parts. Let's try another one. Shout out to my colleague, Professor Doug Jewers, who got my attention to this problem from Mahajan's book. Based on the cost of a long haul airline ticket, can you estimate the volume of the fuel tank of a Boeing 747? As with any Fermi problem, it sounds absolutely absurd and almost intractable to begin. When I first heard this problem, I wasn't even sure whether the answer would be a few thousand or a few hundred thousand liters for the fuel tank volume. But then again, the key lies in starting, breaking it down into more relatable estimates and a little patience. I am most familiar with the Delhi to New York long haul flight, which I take often. So let's use that as our representative trip. A typical non-stop one way Delhi to New York flight these days costs about $1,200. The operating airline, of course, incurs many costs. There is the crew, fuel, there is food, there is maintenance, airport charges, and of course, they also want to make some profit. But I think it's reasonable to estimate that about 30% of all operating costs go towards fuel for the flight, which makes it that about $360 is what each passenger is spending on fuel for that long haul flight. How many passengers are on a flight this big? Now there are about 50 rows and each row has about 10 people sitting in it. So we have about 10 people, 10 passengers per row, giving us an estimate of about 500 passengers on board. And thus making the fact that we are spending a total of about $180,000 on fuel for the long haul flight. If we can now estimate the cost of jet fuel per liter, we should be able to find out how much total fuel is used in this long haul flight. Now jet fuel will be higher octane than the gas used in automobiles, making it more expensive. But airline companies would also buy it in bulk and therefore get a discount on the fuel. Let's say these two effects balance each other out and jet fuel to these airline companies cost the same as what you and I pay for regular octane at the pump, which nowadays is going for about 90 cents per liter. So it's about 0.9 dollars per liter of fuel. That's the cost or the jet fuel that we approximated to be. With this, we can all put it together now. We are spending about $180,000 on fuel at a rate of about 90 cents per liter, which gets us 180,000 divided by 0.9 per liter, giving us an estimate of about 200,000 liters of fuel used in this long haul flight. And one can make an argument that for such long haul travels, the plane rather be filling its gas tank to almost full. And therefore, this is probably a good guesstimate for the volume of a fuel tank of a Boeing 747. I'm going to refer to this simple flying article on how much fuel does a Boeing 747 hold. And a little scrolling down gets me the fuel capacity to be anywhere between 190 and 220,000 liters, depending on the exact 747 model. Intuition and logic indeed go a long way, a skill essential in critical thinking. As with any Fermi problem, the exact number isn't crucial. Approaches to such problems can be many and non-unique. What's important is understanding which facts to consider and being able to give quick and informed estimates for them. So remember, whether you're tackling everyday challenges or complex scientific questions, 
Fermi problems equip you with the power of estimation, turning the seemingly impossible into the intriguingly solvable. Next time you're faced with a complex problem, remember Fermi's approach. Make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Happy estimation.